Norway and the UK are neighbours, separated only by the North Sea, with its rich mine of oil and gas reserves. But whilst Norway has used its good fortune to become the richest country in the world, we shall see how the UK's oil bonanza was largely squandered. Norway invested the proceeds of oil in a sovereign wealth fund, which now stands at $1.4 trillion, the biggest in the world. The UK, by contrast, has no wealth fund, but it could have been very different. For many years, the UK produced more oil and gas than Norway, but the outcome couldn't have been more different. Let's find out why. In the 1970s, the UK was reeling from high inflation, industrial unrest, low growth, and embarrassingly for once the largest economy in the world, it had to be bailed out by the IMF. Against this backdrop, the Labour Prime Minister James Callaghan declared that oil was God's gift to the British economy. And it could well have been the case. For a time, the UK was one of the top 10 oil producers in the world. But here's a strange thing about discovering oil. It can be a mixed blessing or even a curse. Many countries discover oil but don't actually benefit from it. The so-called oil curse or Dutch disease. Venezuela, Iran, Libya, Russia, all countries with huge oil reserves but failing economies. Striking oil is no guarantee of success. But Norway is widely regarded as a role model on how to benefit from an oil and gas bonanza. So how did Norway go from a small economy based on fishing and shipping to one of the richest countries in the world? And it's important to bear in mind that this is not just a selective use of economic statistics. Whichever method of living standards you use, Norway is pretty close to the top on every metric, be it healthcare, education, low pollution, etc. Well, like many European countries, Norway suffered immensely in the Great Depression, mass unemployment and the rise of political extremism. In the post-war period, there was a strong motivation to build a more cohesive economy. They developed a comprehensive welfare state, education and healthcare. Tax rates were one of the highest in the world, but it was a conscious decision to spread the proceeds of economic growth throughout society. In fact, there were similarities with the UK, who also established a welfare state in the post-war period. Now, when oil was discovered in the late 1960s, the Norwegian government laid down the principle that oil should be used to make a qualitative, better society. The industry was put under democratic control, with the government retaining 70% ownership of the oil fields and oil companies. But in the UK, the election of Mrs Thatcher in 1979 heralded a very different economic philosophy. Thatcher was an adherent of free markets, and the mantra of the government was privatise. Brit Oil and BP were all privatised in the 1980s. And unlike Norway, it left the UK with no direct stake in the ownership of oil and gas fields. In 1980, the UK Cabinet Office warned that privatisation of Brit Oil would raise one billion in the short term, but it would be at a very high cost in the long term from lost proceeds. Studies have suggested that the UK missed out on at least $400 billion of tax revenues if they had followed the Norwegian model of high tax rates and state ownership. Shukdev Johal, a professor of accounting at Queen's Mary, London, thinks that the UK could have had a sovereign wealth fund of £850 billion had the UK followed the Norwegian model. That's around £13,000 per person, or 33% of the UK's national debt. The National Resource Governance Institute argues that since 1970, the UK government received only around $11 a barrel. By contrast, the Norwegian government received around $30 a barrel. That's an extra $19 per barrel. And it explains why Norway has received £1.2 trillion and the UK only £400 billion. The extra $19 per barrel explains why Norway received $1.2 trillion and the UK tax revenues only accounted for $400 billion. There are four reasons why the UK had lower tax receipts than Norway. Firstly, the UK produced more oil when prices were low. Norway produced more when prices were high. Secondly, state ownership in Norway 
led to a steady stream of dividends that went direct to the government. Thirdly, Norway had significantly higher tax rates on oil than the UK. And fourthly, extracting oil from Norway's oil field was actually cheaper than the UK, so it was more profitable and more profit to be taxed. In the UK, overall privatisation receipts in the 80s and 90s was around £67 billion. How was this spent? Well, the main motivation of the government was to cut tax rates, in particular tax on high earners. Income tax was cut from 60% to 40%, corporation tax cut from 52% to 33%, and combined with a rise in unemployment and a growth of the finance sector, the 1980s in the UK saw a surge in inequality, with a 33% rise in the gap between rich and poor. John Hawksworth, the chief economist at PricewaterhouseCooper, wrote a paper called Dude, Where's My Oil Money? He suggested that a lot of the boom in income for higher earners which occurred in the 1980s was invested in real estate and housing, causing that 1980s boom in house prices. During this period, social housing was also privatised, sold off, but despite a boom of oil tax revenues, there was no long-term investment. In fact, whilst taxes were cut, public sector investment was significantly cut back from 4% of GDP to just 1% in the early 1990s. Decisions which impact the economy today. Now, the argument for the uh, free market approach to the economy and privatisation was that it would encourage enterprise, greater efficiency and higher economic growth. And there were some benefits of privatisation, e.g. BT helped improve efficiency and lower prices. But overall, economic growth in the 1980s and early 90s was a mixed bag. Very high unemployment in the early 80s, then the boom in the later years, and then the deep recession at the end of the decade. The result was that economic growth was very similar to every other decade in the post-war period. There was no disaster, but there was no economic miracle. Oil didn't really damage the economy, but there was no long-term benefit. Though interestingly, you could argue that the a sharp increase in production of oil in the early 80s contributed to a surge in the value of a pound. At one point, one pound was worth $2.5. And this very high exchange rate crippled British exporters, causing a devastating decline in British manufacturing in the early 1980s. And this is one reason why oil can be a mixed blessing. It caused an increase in the exchange rate, which damaged other areas of the economy. But one thing is clear about the UK experience. There was never much effort to make long-term investment from the proceeds of oil. It was all very much short-term gain. But Norway took a diametrically opposite approach. The proceeds from oil would be invested for the future. Norway set up a sovereign wealth fund in the 90s. And this sovereign wealth fund was to invest in companies outside Norway and in other industries. And it included some real estate, such as many properties in Regent Street or London. And the investment had to meet ethical concerns, meaning that Norway has an international clout far beyond its small size. It helped that Norway was more patient. There wasn't the same hunger to finance short-term tax cuts and provide short-term political benefits. They were also more patient with production, holding back during lower prices and avoiding a surge in the currency, which caused some problems for the UK. The investment fund, which has been so successful, was set up to be protected from short-term political pressures. The government could not spend the capital, only spend a share of the income from the investments. And this income could be spent on welfare such as education and healthcare and long-term investment in the skills of the population. And this is the success of the Norwegian model. There was strong trust, a strong desire to use the proceeds of oil for the benefit of a wider population. Interestingly, both Norway and the UK had referendums on EU membership to, and both rejected EU membership by a very similar majority, 52-48. Yet there was also a big difference in what that led to. In the UK, very hard Brexit with leaving the single market and customs union. Whereas in Norway, leaving the EU or not joining the EU, they preferred to have very close economic cooperation. And that's been a factor in the uh, UK's problems in recent years. Now, Norway is not without its problems. It has one of the highest costs of living in the world. In recent years, like everywhere else in Europe, house prices have risen, especially in Oslo. But even adjusted to the cost of living, Norway has the second highest levels of consumption in Europe. 
And also it's got this huge benefit of its long-term investment in a sovereign wealth fund, which will help it to transition to a green economy. Also, it has very successfully invested in a post-oil economy. It's a leader in renewable energy, the number of electric cars and heat pumps. The UK has made some progress with building wind farms in the North Sea, but generally the past decades have been a missed opportunity to make more of a transition to a post-oil economy. Some might argue that Norway's welfare state is overgenerous. It spends 4.3% of GDP on incapacity benefits, the second highest in the OECD. But whilst free market think tanks may like to warn about the disincentives of a welfare state, on the other side of a coin, a highly educated and cohesive society has many benefits for productivity, entrepreneurship and labour productivity. Norway has one of the lowest rates of not in education, employment or training. It ranks in the top 10 for ease of doing business. And the real success behind Norway's growth and transition away from oil is of a highly educated workforce. Norway has a good number of IT startups and a booming service sector. There's life after oil. Now, the economic decline in the UK, the, the difficulties the UK has had in recent years, has many other factors. And this video goes into more detail on some of the other factors that are hurting uh, the UK economy in recent years. 